you were about to meet one amazing artist and somebody who's a really terrific person as well. Meet Nancy Tankersley. Hi, Nancy. Hey, Eric. Welcome. Oh, my studio. <laughs> is that, That's your studio. It's lovely. It is. Uh, yeah, it has quite a history. Uh, it, used, it started out as a hardware store and uh, then I think it was a liquor store. And about uh, 15 years ago, it became a uh, photographer's gallery. Really? And, uh, when that closed, uh, it sat empty for a couple of years, but it had been renovated beautifully with brick walls and skylights and everything. So uh, in 2010, another artist, Louis Escobedo, and I decided to rent the space and hold workshops here and uh, teach on a weekly basis. So uh -huh. we did that. So at that time, it was very slick down, so we had lots of room for students. And uh, then in 2013, Lewis went out on his own, and I took took the space over as my own studio. Okay. Uh, which is why I have such a big, wonderful studio. <laughs> so is it is it like a retail space? Uh, is it, it is. Yeah, or? it's in an old strip mall, uh, just on the outskirts of the Easton Business District. But it's a new. This the area has just been designated an arts and entertainment district. Nice. And, which is very exciting. So this is included in the arts and entertainment district. Cool. But the kind of the sad, happy thing is um, I'm getting ready to leave this space. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, people say, why would you leave this? But, well, um, as great as it is, uh, it's not in my home. And I've kind of entered that stage of my life where my husband and I think it would be a good idea for us to be in the same physical space. So um, we're in the process of uh, converting a building, which is just kind of diagonal to this corner. It was an architect's uh, studio, and we're converting it into a home where I can have my studio. Oh, and, perfect. Uh, it's so you'll actually end up with a better situation. It will be better. It's going to have fabulous light, and uh, maybe this time next year you can visit that studio, and I'll show you around. All right. So we're very excited sounds, about that. Sounds like a great project. So, Nancy, what are you going to do for us today? I'm going to um, talk about uh, glazing. Uh, glazing? Glazing, yep. Doesn't sound like something a plein air painter does, but... Uh, well, you know, I think it's really important. I was... Uh, Graydon Parrish and I were talking when he was over at, Real, at um, Realism Live, uh -huh. and he said to me, I could make a lot of money if I would just teach people glazing. He said, everybody wants to know about glazing. He said, I don't do it. Everybody thinks I do it. He said, that's like, that's what everybody wants. So I think you're going to have a popular one today. Well, good, good. Yeah. Um, all right. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll come back to you in just a minute. And okay. uh, then we're going to learn all about glazing. Yep. I do want to show a little bit of my studio when you come back. Oh, I like Walk that. Good. Through. Pardon? I said, okay. that'd be great. Okay, good. All right. Terrific. Our guest today is Nancy Tankersley. And Nancy has the distinction of having founded Plein Air Easton. She'll tell you about that, I'm sure, hopefully. Anyway, uh, my name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. We're here every single day since coronavirus uh, quarantines began. That was 226 days ago. And uh, we've been at it trying to uh, keep you um, preoccupied by learning about art, growing in art. And one of the things that is really cool, I, I was actually talking about this because I had to record a video. Uh, I'm receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award from the California Art Club, and it's all virtual, so I had to record a thank you video. And I was kind of talking about this daily thing and how the thing that's really nice about it is uh, I have heard from people all over the world. You, you have every day we're seeing people commenting. We have people probably in 30, 40 countries watching this on a regular basis or watching the replays on a regular basis. We're hearing from people who've said things like, you know, I, um, I just discovered this. I kind of uh, happened into it and uh, I hadn't painted in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. And because I started seeing these, I've picked up a pencil again or a paintbrush again, and I've started painting again. On the opposite end of that spectrum, we've had people who have said, you know, I never even thought about art. I never considered it. I never watched how art was done. And because I stumbled into this, I was actually 
uh, inspired enough to decide to take it up. So they've been watching daily, and now some of them have signed up for online lessons, or some of them have actually found instructors. Some are watching the the you know hundreds of videos that we've produced. And so that's pretty cool. And then the other side of that still is artists who are saying, you know, I am improving. I have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm upping my game because I'm watching new things every day and I'm learning techniques that I hadn't known before. So I think it's really cool. And so that's what we're trying to do here for you. You know, the world is crazy. It seems like 2020 is the year we all want to forget. And it just doesn't seem like it's getting any easier. And I keep saying to folks that you've got to keep your head in the game, right? I think that phrase originally came from the, uh, my kid uh, tells me it originally came from the movie High School Musical. Uh, and, and the idea here is that uh, we can get ourselves completely consumed and allow ourselves to be brought down by everything that's going on in the world. You know, we can sit around and become glued to the news, which is real easy to do be glued to social media, and the vitriol negativity that's happening all around the world on social media just isn't good for our heads. And, you know, if if we, uh, it, you know, we would never go to a place to have somebody, you know, hit us in the head with the punching bag, yet we're doing that every day on social media. So I want you to be careful, and I'm trying to provide this for you so that you have things to, uh, to, to, get you lifted up and feeling good about yourself and not getting consumed by all the negativity. Anyway, enough about that. Anyway, thank you for watching day 226. Uh, we have a winner. I mentioned yesterday, I'm giving away a plein air apron. The winner of the plein air magazine apron is Renata Weimeyer. Weimeyer. Renata Weimeyer from New Jersey. Sounds like a good German name, Renata. Uh, congratulations and thank you. The way you win a prize is by making comments in the comments section. If you're from outside of the U.S., make sure you tell us where you're from. That helps just so we actually everybody tell us where you're from. And if you've never made a comment, please do so. Today's prize is my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art. And uh, it is the book that I wrote to try to get everybody started. Anybody who wants to learn how to sell their artwork, their craft, their photography, their, you know, anything that's creative. This book kind of gives you and lays out the real basic foundational principles that you need. The reality is that all marketing requires foundational principles, and it's real easy to get seduced by things that seem like everybody's jumping on them and to follow the bandwagon. You know, everybody wants to move to social media. That's fine. But there are certain principles that if you don't employ them on social media, they're not going to work for you. And the same thing if you don't employ them in your in your ads, your print ads, your direct mail, your websites, your newsletters. If you don't use those things, they're not going to work for you. So that this book is really about things that are going to work for you. It's called Make More Money Selling Your Art, and it's on Amazon. You can also find it at artmarketing.com, which is my blog about marketing art. Okay, so make sure you leave comments. And remember, we're checking comments after the live. Uh, we have People in the replays, we are on multiple platforms, YouTube and LinkedIn and and uh, Twitter and Instagram, et cetera. So we're checking them all. So make sure to leave a comment. All right. A couple other things. First off, the Plein Air Salon art competition for the month ends on the 30th of the month. And then you want to get, uh, get your entry in. Uh, just go to pleinairsalon.com. If you've never entered before, one thing that's helpful is to put your head in the game. There's something that switches on. You know, when you decide that you're going to compete for prizes with other artists in art competitions, it's a switch that goes off in your head. And all of a sudden, you're thinking about things differently. You know, if you're just kind of casually painting around the house, the studio or whatever, and you're not really uh, looking to be a professional, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But the minute that you kind of start entering things things start falling together. All of a sudden you're working harder on your, you're not, you're not letting something go. I, you know, I'm working on a painting right now. I'm really struggling with, and I will not let it go. I, the other day I thought, well, it's good enough. And then I thought, no, good enough. Isn't good enough. Right. So you want to do things that kind of push you to the next level. And California art club told me years ago that uh, one of the reasons they've got so many quality artists in the club is because they do these competitions, the annual gold medal 
And what happens as a result of that is that you really push yourself to the next level. And so we, we think that's always a good thing. I want to remind you guys that you can follow me, Eric Rhodes. It's spelled R-H-O-A-D-S with no E. Uh, follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. I can't follow you back on Facebook. You can follow Eric Rhodes Publisher on Facebook. Uh, I can, I guess I can't follow you back on that because that's a business page. But anyway, I'd like for you to do that. The other thing I'd like for you to do is to go to YouTube and search the word Streamline Art Video. And uh, I'd like everybody to do it, even if you're not watching on YouTube, because I'm trying to hit a goal on YouTube. I got to get to 100,000 followers. There, I, I, last I checked, it was about 52, 53,000. And if you would do that for me, uh, I know there's no real benefit to you. Well, actually, there is a benefit. The benefit is that all of the content, all 226 days, there's art marketing lessons in there. There's interviews. There's art gallery visits. There's artists. There's all kinds of things. It's all categorized there if you hit subscribe. So go to youtube.com, search Streamline Art Video, and hit subscribe. If you just do that for me, that would be really terrific. You could do it right now. And uh, just know that I'm here. Uh, if you're just discovering this for the first time, I'm here every day at 12 noon weekdays. And it's, again, Facebook, YouTube, and just search Streamline Art Video. Also, if you're new, we have a video for you. It's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Best Artists. We gathered a lot of the clips from a lot of the videos that we've created and put them together with a lot of great ideas. It's very helpful. It's a $107 value. It's two hours in length, and it's yours as our gift to you at 97tips.com. And thank you for that. Um, today at 3 p.m., uh, we're going to be giving you a sample of the brand new, just released Daniel Sprick portraits video. Now, Daniel Sprick is, as you may or may not know, one of the premier artists in the world. Uh, his portraiture is absolutely beyond amazing. And uh, we have worked for years to try to get Daniel to come on board and do a video with us. And it finally has occurred. And so the first one is gonna be called simply Portraits. And you're gonna see a snippet of that today. It's gonna be huge. Uh, and you'll also get a special discount today only uh, that will be in the comments section when you watch the 3 p.m. So make sure you watch that. That's Daniel Sprick Portraits. And just to give you an idea, I mean, this is uh, this is the portrait that he's done. Uh, he just manages to get uh, just to nail people so beautifully. And so it's it's going to be worth seeing. All right. I think, well, there's a there's a picture of it. I need a close up of that. It'd be nice to have. Now, last but not least, uh, we are doing an event called Watercolor Live, and Watercolor Live will be the world's largest watercolor conference. We've done uh, just done uh, Plein Air Live, uh, which was the world's largest plein air and landscape conference. We've just done Realism Live, which was the world's largest, had people from 27, 30 countries and instructors from other countries. Now we're doing Watercolor Live and we have the best instructors in the world. This is coming in late January, but if you sign up before the end of this month, before the end of the 30th, you're gonna save $200. And even though it's a great deal if you pay more, why pay more? Because you could take that $200 and buy art materials or or have, you know, go out to dinner or something. So uh, this is something you should check out. We've got uh, an incredible lineup of artists. Anyway, enough about that. Uh, I think that's all my announcements. Now we'll get back to Nancy Tankersley. Nancy, tell us about um, who do we have here, first off? Oh, this is my uh, friend and artist, uh, Rhonda Ford. And Hi. she's going to be with the photography. Uh, Rhonda started Plein Air three years ago. And uh, if you haven't heard her name yet, you're going to. <laughs> oh, outstanding, Rhonda. Yeah. <laughs> Nice meeting you. you too. Uh, Nancy, real quickly, tell us about the founding of Plein Air Easton. Oh, my gosh. I can't do that quickly. <laughs> um, it started in 2004. Um, we knew that this was a big event and uh, a Plein Air that was a big movement, and we wanted to get on board. And I had just moved to Easton, um, wasn't really familiar with the town, so I got to know Al Bond, who was the economic development officer. And between the two of us, we came together with a festival that has worked really well for this area and uh, has endured, just finished its 16th year. Um, 
it's been a wonderful boon to the uh, local economy and uh, to artists in the area. And uh, well, it's also become one of the most well-known and one of the most respected plein air events in in it America. Has. And, and I think the key to that is we had a really dedicated group of volunteers. Easton is kind of a retirement area for uh, D.C., Philly, Baltimore. So you get a lot of people with a lot of skills that come over here and then get involved in volunteer activities. And they have a lot of uh, experience to draw upon. So we started with really high, high class group of volunteers and also because Easton most of the time is a sleepy little town. Um, this event in the, the heat of summer um, became the go-to event. Um, you know, so it a lot of lot of things combined to make it um, the success it is today. Cool. But I have to say the volunteers and you know, the Avalon Foundation, which is a very young, uh, vibrant, uh, smart group of uh, people. Um, they put it together the right way. So. Terrific. Yeah. So uh, we're going to let you get started. So you might want to readjust your camera. I'm not sure exactly what you're going to, how you're going to you do. If you don't mind, I'm going to walk you through the studio. Oh, do, yeah. Do the studio tour. That's great. So it's a long, thin space. And prior to COVID, it was all teaching. But since I've been by myself since March, I've kind of adapted it to my own needs. So the first part is kind of my gallery and um, I have so much work here because so many shows are now virtual. Um, if you look down at the four that I have in the bottom, they are now part, can you see them? Oops. <laughs> we have, can you see them, Eric? Yeah, we can see them. Yeah, those are part of the uh, Waterfowl Festival virtual show that started on November 1st. Uh, the Waterfowl Festival is our other big um, festival here in Easton. It's been going on for 50 years, and well, it would have been 50 years this this year. And they made the choice to to delay it, the 50th celebration till till next year. It would have uh, been happening next weekend, but instead it is virtual. So I encourage people to check it out. It's uh, www.waterfowlfestival.org. It's a really okay. great partner. Perfect. Yeah, it's a really great organization and another uh, boom for the artists in the area. So if we move through here. Um, I don't envy you having to move that space. You got a lot of stuff. <laughs> this is only part of it. I have a big storage locker too. So um, anyhow, this was last year. I was honored to be the um, the featured artist at the Waterfowl Festival. Nice. Uh, they gave me this nice poster, and I use it as kind of a room divider as well as. Um, just a you know, nice bit of color. Well, it's nice. It's nice to, to know you were selected for that. It was wonderful. And it was interesting because um, I've always I've always liked painting working people. And yeah. when I first moved here, I was so busy with plein air and the gallery and everything. I didn't really think how my theme of working people fit into the Eastern Shore um, until I um, was commissioned to do some portraits of watermen and uh, I had some really wonderful relationships with some of the local watermen, and that kind of drew me into the culture. So I, in the last six years, have really done a, a great many paintings of the working watermen of the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, so this is this was one of the paintings. And, uh, and did you say it's waterfowlfestival.com? Yeah, waterfowlfestival.org. Yeah. Oh, dot .org. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll put it up on screen for everybody. That'd be great. Yeah, they'll appreciate it. Okay, so moving into this part is my, my working part. And I have a lot of paintings that um, are in various stages. Um, some of them have just been taken out of frames. And uh, I've been- Nancy, there's a, there's a show that you, you should be on. It's called Hoarders. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I have tried really hard to get rid of I'm joking. It's you got, but you got a lot of you got a lot of cool stuff. You know, I've been painting a long time, yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, a lot of this is the last 15 years. You can see all my still life objects back there. I uh, no, that's nice. That's I a love idea. To use still still life as a. I love still lifes, but I also like to use them as a teaching device. I think they're really essential. And then I've got my shipping uh, shipping center. I've got a painting ready to go to uh, Texas. <laughs> Um, I'm real excited 
I have two children in Texas and I, and I just got into a gallery in Texas and in Fredericksburg, uh, Gallery 330. And I'm just excited to build up that connection. Oh, good. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. Okay. So um, Rhonda's going to come over and set up the camera in front of this painting. And um, as you know, I like to do all subjects. I'm, I don't limit myself in subject matter. And uh, this is a... Uh, is it on? Yeah. This was a, a portrait that I did... Um, this is one of the advantage, advantages of COVID. You get to do these projects that you've been thinking about forever. But many years ago, my aunt gave me a black and white photo of uh, my grandfather, who I never knew, um, but he, because he died the year I was born. But he was a, a machinist in the steel yards in Baltimore, Maryland. And I always thought it would make a cool painting. So um, I finally have had the chance to uh, work up this little painting. Nice. And uh, I think, you know, it is a good example of a painting that would benefit from some glazing. Uh, okay. Glazing is, you know, a technique of laying a transluent, translucent layer of painting over or of paint over a dry painting. Right. And, uh, you know, back in college, I learned I learned about glazing. We also uh, talked about scumbling, which is um, I think the definition of that is um, putting a dry layer of paint over a dry layer, a dry layer of paint over a dry painting. It's a more of a broken technique right. um, than, than glazing. So right. on this one, I'm just going to try some pure glazing. You know, glazing kind of got out of fashion because we, you know, with plein air, we just con concentrate so much on the a la prima method, um, right. direct painting, and we don't have the time to do glazing generally. Well, because typically something has to dry first. Exactly, exactly. But I have uh, increasingly been using it on paintings that are just kind of missing the mark. And I've encouraged my students to experiment with it too. Now that we have you know, so much studio time, um, it's, a, it's a good thing to know. And um, so anyhow, for this one, I think this painting would benefit by um, pushing, consolidating the background a little bit and pushing, um, the uh, the various shapes that I've introduced there further back, uh, there fo therefore focusing more on his um, on his face. I also want to show you one that I did glaze. I gla I I did. This is called my. This is my COVID um, portrait that I did of my husband uh, two months into COVID, where he had actually grown uh, facial hair, and. Um, put a, a semi-cowboy hat on him and uh, painted this from life. And the problem I had with this painting was getting the value exactly right on the eyes. Uh, let me see, can you see that there? Yeah. Keeping, keeping those eyes in the shadow, yeah. but also, you know, keeping them visible so that you can see the structure of the eyes and yeah. understand what's going on there. So. Um, when all was said and done with this one, I applied a, a light glaze of ultramarine and it pushed those eyes back a little without obscuring them. So I want to show you something because it's it's just kind of an interesting discussion. But so this particular painting, let's see if we can find it here, is, is one that I'm working on. And it's oh, the wow. same kind of thing as I had to glaze nice. over the eyes. It's a little dark in here, but... Yeah. had to glaze over the eyes to be able to get that to keep retained, but, but, uh, but uh, show the, the sense of the darkness from the hat. Exactly. That's exactly <clears throat> what, what you want to use the glaze for. Of course, I'm, you know, uh, classical, let me see if I get the classical. Um, yeah. The closer you can get that, the better. Okay. While you're working on that, you've got viewers from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Oh, wonderful. Uh, we have Norway. Let's see here. I just saw uh, got a bunch in Canada, throughout different parts of Canada, and uh, Quebec. Well, Vancouver. I want to tell the Norway people. My great great grandfather came from Norway, and my grandfather's last name was Nielsen. So awesome. hello there. <laughs> we have Portugal. We got a lot of Portugal and Spain yesterday. We got Kazakhstan. Welcome, brand new from Kazakhstan. This is fun. I like this. Excellent. 
All right. Well, okay. We're going to let you get started on glazing. I'm going to just, I will pass along questions as we go. Okay. Uh, are you going to be able to show your palette at all? Um, not too well, but maybe Rhonda can dip it down when I need to. Mostly I'm going to pick up things like this. Um, when I talk about how you make the glaze. Okay. Um, the, you know, the, the important thing of glazing is you're just, you're applying a translucent layer of paint. Sometimes you can take a, a paint that is already a, a transparent color and just uh, kind of rub it on without putting any median, medium in it whatsoever. But uh, other times you're gonna want to thin the, uh, the paint layer down. And, and to do that, you need a glazing medium. Um, I don't profess to be an expert on all the chemistry of behind glazing, and I know there are books written on it, but I think the basic thing is it has to be a fairly fat layer of paint. You don't want to thin a paint down with a solvent and apply it because then you're just going to have a very thin layer over, you know, some fat layers. So you want a fat layer, meaning there's a lot of oil. Um, I could possibly just use, um, this is uh, water wash linseed flax oil. I could use that straight, but it would take a long time to dry. So I tend to thin it a little bit with either um, a solvent or um, I'm fond of using oil spike lavender. Um, I, I have tried to kind of rid my studio of petroleum products. So I'm using now, um, solvents and um, mediums that are don't have any petroleum in the process it's you know when you've been painting as long as i have you know sometimes that builds up in your system and and i just want to paint yeah. less toxically so anyhow so my medium is this water wash linseed oil i've thinned it with a little bit of oil spike lavender and i am ready to go as far as what does that mean oil spike lavender Pardon? Spike. What does that mean? You got me. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I maybe it's the lavender spikes. I I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I've heard of spike oil, uh, but I, I maybe somebody in the comments will know. Yeah, that that's a good question. But oil spike lavender. I, I could also use rather than that something like this, which is assistance a uh, citrus essence brush cleaner. It's a natural solvent. Um, it, you know, there are so many, many uh, recipes. You could just use uh, Gamblin's Neo McGilp, which uh, mimics Marojé medium. Um, right. Um, well, Marojé kind of came from your area, didn't it? I think it did. Yeah, because I, I think uh, Marojé uh, taught in Baltimore. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Um I have never used it myself, but I, I did use a lot of the Neo McGilp medium, which I found uh, a really good one. So you could use that. You could use Liquin. Um, a lot of people that are real purists um, like to have Damar in their uh, mixtures. Um, but then in that case, you need to be using turpentine and not um, mineral spirits. So I don't want to get too much in the technicalities. Yeah. I think the main thing is you just need uh, um, something that will thin the, the paint down to where it's transparent and will flow easily. All right. The paint. So I am going to, um, also I like to use a brush that is pretty soft. Uh, so you know, more, more like a, uh, like a sable or something. Sable, yeah. This is actually Gray Matters by Jack Richardson, but it's a, a nice soft uh, bristle. So, and this one I'm going to use, um, I'm going to try ultramarine violet. I'm going to try glazing with that. And the good thing about glazing is if you don't like the results, you can take some solvent and wipe it off. And yeah. you get, you know, 95% of it off. So it's How dry does your painting need to be? Uh, it needs to be dry to the touch. Okay. Um, so I don't know if, uh, let me see if I can dip that down and you can see. Oops. <laughs> you I'm see, getting seasick. All right. Can you see how I've thinned that out? Yeah. Using the, I've got my medium here and this is the, the purple and I have thinned it out. And now I'm going to 
try and see if I've got enough pigment. I can't see yet. All right. Okay. Is that lined up good? So yeah. your goal is to darken it or to push it back, give it more push distance? Push it back and kind of unify it. You know, I have actually, uh, since there wasn't much information in the black and white photo, I've just kind of put abstract shapes in there um, that would, like I actually, and I don't know if you can see this at all, I've indicated a, um, a time clock. <laughs> you know, that was kind of from my imagination. There's a half a circle back there. Um, and so I just tried to, to make a busy shop-like environment But, you know, it, it may be too busy. So I don't know. Is the glare too bad there? Well, it's kind of tough on the left side. or the Yeah, the left side, is, it's hard to tell what's happening. But you can see it really well on the, yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly that unified it. And then if you wanted to, I guess you can pull out. If you wanted to highlight something, you pull it out a little bit. I could. I, I'm thinking it needs to be a little darker. So I am going to take. Um, a little bit of ultramarine and a little bit of alizarin crimson. All right. And I'm going to make a glaze of that. I actually just reached into my Indian yellow to, uh, to dull it a little bit. I don't want it to have too much color. So that's, I can, I can see, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, we can see that. See that it has darkened considerably. I don't know which way it'd be better yeah. for the glare. <laughs> so Eric, you're going to have, see this, I like this, uh, looks like a file cabinet back there with um, folders in it. I like it, but I don't want it to be too important. So. Well, also the minute you do that, the light on him just stands out so much more. Yeah, yeah, it does. So now I th I'm not sure his face is dry, but if, if it were dry enough, I could, for instance, put a layer of glaze in this part that would push the lower part of his face back and you know, further emphasize the dimension dimensionality of uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, So anyhow, that's what... I would do for this one. And then, it, like I said, if I didn't like it, if I wanted to get rid of it in some areas, I could do that. All right, so that's just kind of a simple dark glaze. All right, can you show that uh, right in front of the camera real quickly? Oh, good, we can see it. All right, terrific. What a difference that made. Yeah. You can still see the detail stuff. back there, but just it's not not standing out nearly as much. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so then I want to work on a, um, a, a landscape that I did earlier this year for a, um, I was teaching a uh, Italian, painting the Italian landscape course online, which was a real interesting experience. <laughs> and uh, actually, I, I pretty successful, I think. I think people are starting to understand the um, the advantages to Zoom. Yeah. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is a, um, I think a, it's a square panel. I think it might be 16 by 16. And um, I was interested in trying to get some geometry, you know, breaking up the shape in an interesting way. And this was actually from a uh, just a snapshot I took when we were uh, on the bus last year in, in Italy. And uh, I actually really enjoy the challenge of taking an ordinary photograph and um, trying to make something of it. You know, I, I unashamedly use a lot of photographs, but I, I constantly tell my students, don't copy the photograph. You know, yeah. take from the photograph what, what you can use. And this was a, a small part of a, a photograph as we were speeding down the highway. And when I zoomed in on it, I could see these interesting geometrical shapes, you know, against these looming mountains. And uh, so I decided to focus in on, on this area. 
So I think, you know, I'm pretty happy with everything that's going on in the buildings and, and the foreground, but this doesn't separate from the background enough. So what I want to do is try to get this part of the tree, this part of the tree to jump out more. And to do that, I think I'm going to have to make a, a slight value shift and a slight color shift. So what I want to do over here is I want to deepen this and cool this. This is the shadow side of the mountain. And then I want to maybe warm and lighten over here. We'll see how that, you know, affects it. But first I'm going to go with the, um, the, the dark, the shadow side of the mountain. And so what am I going to use? I could use, um, I could use pure ultramarine blue, which is probably a real safe, um, solution. I could use a cobalt blue. I could take that and, and thin it. Actually, I'm going to try the cobalt blue and see All right. if that doesn't give a, uh, an interesting. Now we're getting a lot of glare on that. Okay. Rhonda, so maybe the photographer can get a little angle or something. Now we're getting more glare. More glare. Okay. Now we got it. Now we got it. Good. <clears throat> okay. So you can see how that has made that jump out. Might be a little too heavy. Um, so I'm going to try removing some of it using this soft cloth. And I, from my angle, that's, that's working. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So then I think I want to try to emphasize the sunlit side of the, um, of this hill. And I'm going to take one of my favorite colors, which is uh, Indian yellow, which is a naturally transparent color. And great sunlight color. It is a great sunlight color. And now we're going to need to move the camera again so we can see that. Which way? I don't know. We're hitting the glare. Yeah. Try tilting it. Down. There you go. Okay. I can't tell. I think that's a little too um, too much yellow, too dark. So I'm actually going to add a little white to my glaze and see if I can still get the. I so up. I guess if you're adding white to a glaze, it's called a veil. Now I've never heard that term. Oh. I I thought it was called a scumble, but then when I looked up the definition of scumble the other night, um, it was different than what I remember being taught. Yeah, um, it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. But it's just light. You the, the point is not only can you darken with a glaze, you can also lighten. Um, so now I've got this situation where the part of the tree is disappearing, you know, and, and that's okay. Um, it's okay because I have such a, a contrast here that the brain and the eye fills in what's happening over there. So that doesn't bother me too much. Um, I would like to have a little more consistency of color going through here. Were, were, when you added white, is that titanium? What kind of white do you use? Yeah, titanium. I pretty much I use uh, titanium, and then I use uh, um, the flake white. Not flake, it's the uh, flake white replacement um, by Gamblin. When okay. I want a, a slightly stiffer paint, so I use both of them. Sometimes I just mix them up and use them together. Um, Okay, so I think I've succeeded with that. Um, I'd like to see a little more difference. Between, there's a field here and then a closer field here. So let me try pushing that one field back. Um, I'm going to pick up, let's see. Uh, somebody's watching and they said, oh boy, I want to paint now. Come on, 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, somebody watching at work. Well, I'm glad I've you know gotten them excited. 
See how just I just dulled that area and that made these trees, these iconic cedars um, pop out a little bit. You know, it's it's really uh, it's really fun to see see what you can do. Uh, I'm going to show another technique I use that I call dry glazing. Okay. And uh, this is a a strange looking tool. We like strange looking tools. These are called potter's nibs. Um, I was introduced to them by uh, uh, John Redmond from Philadelphia, who likes to deconstruct his paintings with them. They're kind of flexible. Um, you can get nice edges with them. You can drag paint. Um, you can see they're, they're well used. But it's hard in, in a painting this size, but in a big painting, I use it frequently to just slightly alter, um, well, actually, to, uh, to add an area of broken color that's not too heavy. So I'm going to try right now using, um, this is a Michael Harding transparent oxide yellow. Okay. I'm going to put some of that out in the palette, spread it out a little bit. Rhonda, can you move on? Yeah. Let's see. Looks like you're using a just a butcher block as your palette. This is, this is a. Um, I got this from Lori Putnam. It's a uh, shop, a roll. You know, a shop storage. Or oh, that's a like, like that. a Costco thing, right? Exactly is where I got it, and then I put glass over it, and uh, it's wonderful. I store my paints and got everything here handy. And, Back when we move, we're just, it's on wheels. We're just going to roll it across the street at midnight. <laughs> so, and then I have my complete studio there. All right, so I have um, sp spread out some of this, and I'm going to pick it up with the edge of my, my blade. And let's see what happens if I just, see, that's a little bit too dark. But I can start spreading. Uh, the glaze with this and you just end up with um so it's not so even not so even exactly it gives texture um it's cutting that kind of acid green a little bit the green i wanted to be a cool green um in contrast to the trees now i've got too much no not a problem i can go in and take it off and these things are nice because they're they're quick, especially when you're um, working on a uh, a really big canvas. So anyhow, if you can you get close to that, you can see that it applies the glaze, but in kind of an irregular fashion. Um, you can even use it for making real de definite um, you know marks that suggest foliage or grass. But anyhow, so that's a, that's another another way of using glazing. How fun. So, yeah, so that actually I'm I'm pretty happy with what went on over here. Another thing I could do if I and I don't think it is, but at one point this was too blue. It 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 distracted from this blue that I have down here, so um, I could continue to push that back by adding, uh, let's say, Indian yellow the way I, I had before. Getting my brushes all mixed up. What is the uh, device called? It's a potter's what? Potter's nib, N-I-B. Mitt? Nib, N-I-B. Nib, okay. Nib, yeah. Where do you get them? I got them on Amazon. I got a set of them for about $40, I think. And they're great. So you can see, I don't know how the glare is on that. I have, Yeah, it looks good. I pushed that sky back, made it a little less important. Yeah. So, okay, so that's, that's this one. And then... You know, it's also, it's a great way to save a painting. You know, sometimes you have something that just isn't right and you go right. in there you can do that and you can probably make it make it look great right 
No, I want to do the, the plein air. So th this one is, um, this is a plein air painting I did last month. And uh, let's see if we can. It, you know, it was one of those that did the late afternoon light as the light was fading. And I had to go back um, two times to get enough information. But, it, you know, it was a, a, a situation where you can only paint for about an hour. Right. And when I got it, you know, and it's about the end of season, the boats being put away and, you know, a site we see here on the Eastern Shore. Or as people grow older, the boats get put away <laughs> and forgotten. And um, what the, my problem area here is is here. There's actually a shed behind the boats, but it all reads in the same value now, and it it doesn't separate at all. And I'd also like to push these background, the distant uh, trees and meadow back a bit well this is going to be fun yeah this is going to be the hard one so uh, give me a minute to clean up a little bit but as i remember that um that building was a, a gray metal building you know not a beautiful structure not something that i you know want to to spend that much attention you know time with but I want it to be a good um, backdrop for the trees. And I want those trees, you know, there's a kind of a dancing rhythm to these trees that I, I really liked. So the trees are, are, you know, a very important element and, and they really, you know, all kind of falls apart there. So I'm going to take that violet um, that I used in the first painting and I'm going to mix it a little bit with the, um, the yellow, the Michael Hardy yellow. Okay. And we'll see what happens if I can. Somebody can't find those on Amazon. Could you use an old credit card the same way? You could, but it wouldn't be flexible. I see. You know, the flexibility is what's so nice. I'm so you know, Princeton makes some things I've seen at the art store very similar to that. Some of them have grooves in them and so on. Uh-huh. They might work. I've tried all of those. I'm, I'm really surprised. I had no problem finding them. Potter's Nib. Yeah, N-I-B-B. -B. Two Bs. I, N -I -B, N -I -B. Well, I'm sure there's a, also a pottery source online that would have something like that. Yeah, I got them maybe five years ago. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, what I've done, I'm really scumbling here, and I am... They're called Potter's that. Ribs, someone said. Really? I... Dick Wick carries pottery, Potter's tools. She said, I'm seeing something similar called Potter's Rib. Well, well maybe. renamed it. Maybe. But, uh... Well, that made a huge difference just by adding that. Yeah, now I got too much white there. That was a, a mistake. But you can see the trees are starting to emerge now. Um, you know, and, and it, this, this is so much quicker and more efficient than, you know, mixing up a whole new color and obscuring, you know, your work. Yeah, somebody said they found them on Amazon at at uh potter's rib r-i-b okay well maybe yeah in that all right all this time <laughs> this is great to have an active community who can google really? these things for us really i'm i'm uh slightly embarrassed no don't be not that much no, slightly <laughs> i don't mind being wrong you know as long as i'm learning something so okay so i've pushed that building back i've separated a bit i think i can do more you know going in the trees themselves um, re-emphasizing, you know, maybe the edge of the, the main trunk. But I don't want to get, I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to um, make that part of the painting too important. Let's see what else. Oh, yeah, I wanted to try calming that down. 
I'm going to do for that area is just apply a, uh, a blue glaze again. I'm going to use cobalt blue. And you know, if you want to know how I choose the colors, it's really trial and error. You know, it's do I want to cool it? Do I want to warm it? Do I want to lighten it? Do I want to darken it? Um, do you find, Nancy, that you can't see what a painting needs until you've let it sit for a while and gotten away from absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, there was a quote, and I will not be able to quote it accurately, that um, Thomas Cole wrote in, in his book that um, paintings need the veil of time. <laughs> yeah. You know, that... Uh, you know, every now and then we'll be so on and the conditions will be so right that we will paint a masterpiece quickly that doesn't need another stroke. But that's pretty rare. Yeah. Even for the masters. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so how long do you let them sit before you you go back to them? How long do I? Yeah. Um, it depends on whether I need it or not. You know, sometimes sometimes years. Yeah. I've actually found myself working on some paintings that have been here for several years during the COVID time. And uh, it just really depends. Fred Picker, um, who is um, uh, Ansel Adams' protege, said that he'll go out and take the photos and he'll develop them immediately, but he won't print them. This is back in the days of printing. Yeah. He said he won't, won't even look at the negatives for a year. Because the things he was most excited about, once he sees them objectively, he realizes they're a lot different. Yeah, yeah. And here, here's a good example of learning to sacrifice. I was initially drawn to this scene because of the strong sunlight hitting this area here and then traveling to the boats, you know, kind of traveling around. I, that was my main thing. But then I got seduced by this brightly lit... Uh, meadow back there yeah and so i'm going back and forth between this and this and so what i really realized just today was that i had to sacrifice this to make this more important right yeah because you can only have one star yeah i mean you can have a lot of uh co and not co-stars but uh what, what's the secondary important cast pardon <laughs> Supporting cast? Support it, yeah, our best supporting actress. You know, you can have a yeah. lot of supporting actress, and then you have the chorus. Um, but you can't have two equally strong focal points. Yeah. I think you, you really need to have one. You know, in this case, and I can get stronger with this, and I, I think I, I would. I think I would like to actually go back and, and emphasize the, uh, the brilliance of those wildflowers and you know with you know a little bit more um white with some cadmium yellow not cadmium uh indian yellow so anyhow there there's i could stop now or i could keep playing but well I, since we've only got a couple minutes left i think it's probably a good time to stop but i think it that, is. that's awesome yeah. how about a round of applause thumbs up for nancy <laughs> tankersley Let's get you back on camera here. All right, Nancy, that's fabulous. What a great lesson that was. You know, nobody has done glazing the entire 226 days. You're the first. Yay. Yay. Um, so people can learn more about Nancy at uh, her website, which is, uh, let's see here, nancytankersley.com, right? That's correct, yep. And the Waterfowl Festival is waterfowlfestival.org. That's correct. Yep. All right. And, and are you doing any, uh, are you doing any workshops? I know one thing I forgot to mention is you have a video with us, uh, which two is called, two pardon videos. me? Two videos. Oh, two. I, that's right. I forgot. I didn't get them both up here. I should have painting figures from photographs. Uh, I, I need to find the other one real quickly. I don't know if I can. Essential, essential principles of painting. It's like where I paint a still life, but I relate it to painting a landscape. Oh, that's right. And that, that was so good because it like contained every lesson you ever need. Thank you. Yeah. yeah that that's was fabulous. Good. Yeah. Well, since you're coming to Austin a lot, we're going to have to have you back and do some more. 
Maybe we'll do one on glazing. Oh, oh God, I better read up on that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to get all the conservators telling me I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> do you, do you, uh, are you doing any uh, online teaching or anything else that people I, need? Right. Well, I've kind of cut back because until we get this house finished and we get moved, I don't want to, Plus COVID, I don't want to tie myself up, but I am doing a, I'm doing online mentoring and I'm doing a weekly Zoom critique with uh, the students that used to meet here on Wednesday afternoon. And I think we're all finding that a lot of fun and, and very valuable. The neat thing about Zoom is an instructor can annotate the painting, you know, everybody can see it equally and then the instructor can annotate and then they can save it. Yeah. So it's a wonderful teaching tool. Absolutely. Well, I hope you guys check out nancytankersley.com. Go buy some paintings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Eric. All right. It was, it was awesome. Thank you. Our guest today was Nancy Tankersley. You can learn more about her at nancytankersley.com. That was a fabulous session on glazing. I like that. That was really terrific. I now realize I've got a lot of things I need to go, go fix. How about you? Well, I want to thank you guys for tuning in from all over the world today. We're here every day at 12 noon. I uh, also want to remind you that uh, November 30th is the deadline to get signed up for Plen Air Salon for this month and also the, save the $200 on the Watercolor Live event. Already got, I, I haven't, last I checked, just 400 people signed up, but I'm sure we're going to end up with, with a huge number. Uh, it's it's going to be massive. I'm just, I can just tell you right now, I mean, we had having people sign up from all over the world. So it's going to be fun. If you want to learn watercolor, what I'm learning is that I'm now starting to take gouache and watercolor with me. Uh, in a lot of places, I don't want to drag all my oil paints and, but I still want to have something that I can feel satisfied with. And so that's why I'm looking forward to it. I can learn more about it and the techniques from the world's greatest watercolor people. Well, thank you guys for watching today. I'll be here tomorrow at 12. No, I won't be here tomorrow. Tomorrow's Saturday. I'm taking weekends off, but I will be there at 3 p.m. today with the new Daniel Sprick video. And also I'll be there at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, so during the weekends, I'm only doing the 3 p.m. I'm not doing the noon, but we will see you today at 3 p.m. You want to see this new Daniel Sprick video. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's just just to, the chance to document these great artists like Daniel, like Nancy, Nancy, who take their, you know, their decades of learning, what they've learned, and they put it all down in a video. It's really fabulous. So you can find Nancy's videos at lilyartvideo.com. Just search Nancy Tankersley. All right. Thank you for watching today. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plin Air Magazines, and we will see you on Monday. Bye-bye.